Welcome to today's CareConnect series webcast on brain wellness. I want to first start by acknowledging that we are hosting this webinar on the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Salish, and tsleil My name is John Andrew, and I'm delighted to be your host today. I'm an associate director at the VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation. And as a fundraiser, my job is to raise funds to support our physicians and researchers that are focused on diseases and conditions that impact the brain, including stroke. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation is Vancouver Coastal Health's primary philanthropic partner, raising funds for specialized adult health services and research for all British Columbians. We partner with donors to support care and research at VGH, UBC Hospital, GF Strong Rehab Centre, Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, and Vancouver Community Health Services. And this is our second webcast in our Care Connect series. If you joined us last time, you heard from experts at the forefront of Vancouver Coastal Health's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we want to turn our attention to brain health. Your brain is what makes you, you. It defines how you think, how you feel, and how you function. When something goes wrong with your brain, it shatters your sense of being and ripples out to family and friends. Here today to provide more insights into the brain are Dr. Silky Cresswell and her colleague, Sally Stelling. We'll hear first from Dr. Cresswell, then Sally will get us up on our feet for something fun and interactive, and then we'll open it up to questions. Dr. Silky Cresswell is the Movement Disorder Neurologist at the Javed Mofagian Center for Brain Health on the UBC campus and co-founder of the BC Brain Wellness Program. Dr. Cresswell will talk about her innovative program that is focused on providing a better quality of life for people living with chronic brain disorders and what each and every one of us can do to keep our brains healthy. After Dr. Cresswell's presentation, Sally will lead us through some examples of cognitive and physical exercises you can do from the comfort of your own home. Just like our own bodies, our brains need exercise as well. As webinar participants, you will be muted, but if you have any questions for our panelists, type your questions in the question chat box. Only panelists can see your questions. As we have a limited time, we will be keeping questions as broad as possible and related to brain wellness, so please refrain from asking specific and personal medical questions. This session will be recorded and made available for viewing afterwards. And for those of you who have joined us via phone, please note that Dr. Cresswell will be referencing PowerPoint slides, so apologies in advance if you cannot see the screen. And without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Silky Cresswell. Good morning. Really lovely to have you all here. Thank you very much for joining. It is such an honor that you spend time with us. And I would like you to learn a little bit about the Brain Wellness Program today, where we're creating a community for well-being for those living with chronic brain conditions, their care partners, really important, and everybody who is aging, which is really all of us. So I'm a neurologist, movement disorder neurologist here at the Java Morphagian Center for Brain Health. That's at UBC Hospital, which you'll see here. And I also work at VGH as a neurologist. And what I'm going to talk about is done in collaboration with the Allen McGavin Sports Medicine Center, which is just down the road from here. Now, the Javad Moafagian um, Center for Brain Health is actually a, a fantastic model of clinicians and scientists working together to improve brain health and to understand how the brain works and, of course, to discover new treatments. My experience as a clinician, though, is that the usual model is I see patients once or twice a year, I write a prescription, give them some good advice, send them on their merry way, and then I repeat the same thing the following year. And somehow that is a bit, that's not quite satisfying. And so when we look at our center where we have the clinicians, we have the scientists, the people we really need to get in on a much more regular and involved basis are the brain users. And by brain users, I mean the patients, their care partners, and those who are undergoing healthy aging. Why the care partners? Well, the care partners are often falling through the net. Brain disorders are pretty much always a family affair. And care partners are absolutely crucial to the patient's journey. Yet they are at risk of developing health conditions themselves. They often have a less healthy lifestyle because they're just so busy they can get isolated and they can burn out. And then, of course, there is that third group, those who are aging and who want to optimize their chances of preventing or at least delaying any brain conditions. So when we're talking about brain health, what are we actually talking about? 
Well, John already mentioned that our brain is really who we are. Without it, we are not. So brain health relates to, of course, our physical health. It relates to our mental and cognitive health, our spiritual, social, and emo emotional well-being. And all of that is, of course, at risk when we develop chronic brain conditions, such as, for example, dementia. Dementia is very much rising in prevalence. So in how many cases we have in the country and worldwide in Canadian seniors. And this rise is pretty much exponential. It is predicted to go up even further with an aging society. And that is true for dementia. This is also true for Parkinson's disease, the condition that I'm particularly uh, interested in. And the bad news is there's currently no medication to prevent dementia or Parkinson's disease or slow down their progression. But the good news is there are very powerful interventions we can all do more or less for free with low risk of side effects and benefits for the brain as well as the body. This picture I took during uh, one of my clinic mornings one day where I stepped out of the clinic and into this hallway and saw this light and I thought it, it was just a very, enlightening moment and I thought is really the light in the tunnel here that uh, we're hoping to gather and uh, harness. So what are all these interventions that we're talking about? So there is for sure exercise and movement really key. There's nutrition, there's good sleep. We now know that in sleep the brain kind of flushes out all these proteins that uh, tend to clog up the brain and uh, are probably involved in causing conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, time spent in nature, being creative, music, other arts, visual performance arts, ongoing learning and being cognitively active, community and fostering healthy relationships. Hearing turns out to be a very important factor. Of course, addressing risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, depression, high alcohol intake and mindfulness and stress reduction. All of those are modifiable behaviors and they all contribute to brain health. And in my clinic, I was really struck over and over again how those people who really engage in exercise are doing just hands down so much better than the people who do not. And I had a conversation with um, Dr. Jack Taunton, who's the founder of sports medicine at UBC, the founder of the Sun Run, the chief medical officer for the 2010 Olympics. And we had this conversation uh, over dinner and uh, we came up with that idea of the brain wellness program. It seems pretty simple. You think, well, you know, everybody can do that. That's not particularly expensive. Why should that do anything? But as we will see, actually there's science to support that, although we need to do much more, but there is good science. Current estimates actually are that we can probably alter about a third of the risk that goes into developing Alzheimer's. So about a third, this will vary from person to person, of course, is due to preventable factors. Now, that is a big number. And as mentioned, we do not have a medication at all that can do that. And if a medication was developed that could reduce the risk by a third, well, that would be a complete bestseller. So there are three of those factors that I'm going to look into with a little bit more depth today. One is exercise and movement, one is nutrition, and then community and relationships. Let's start with exercise. Well, we all know that exercise is good for us, that it helps the brain, but it also helps the body, pretty much most body systems we have. And Robert Butler, the founder of the National Institute on Aging, said, well, if exercise could be purchased in a pill, it would be the single most widely prescribed and beneficial medicine in the nation. Well, that's true. In the meantime, about Thousands and thousands of studies have been done on exercise, including on brain health. And obviously, in a 15-minute presentation, it's impossible to go through all of them. But there are two that I'd like to highlight. One is a study that was done in 120 older adults. It was a randomized controlled trial. So they were either randomly allocated to an aerobic exercise training class, which happened three times per week for one year, or to a 
same frequency and duration stretching class. And what they found in the people who were randomized to the aerobic exercise, so the endurance and getting your heart rate up exercise, was that a very crucial part of our brain, the so-called hippocampus here in yellow, that we need for memory and that is one of the parts of the brain that is particularly affected by Alzheimer's disease, that actually grew in size. This is the, the blue bar here, whereas it continued to shrink as expected in the, those who did stretching. Usually when we get older, our hippocampus shrinks by about a percent or so every year, whereas in those who did the exercise, it actually grew by about 2% meaning they reversed the age-related loss by about one or two years. They also had better spatial memory, so this wasn't just something seen in a scan. And there was an increase in a factor that we know that uh, helps to sustain our brain, which is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So maybe when we go to the gym, it's not just uh, the muscles, but it's really also the brain that we're training. Now that was specifically exercise. Now you might wonder, well, what about the, the activity I do in daily life? You know, the walking I do up and down the stairs and doing the housework and taking the dog out. And it turns out there is a study and that was done in the Framingham Heart Study, which is a, a very big several thousand people study that followed over many, many years. This particular study had just over 2,300 participants, mean age of 53, so middle age. And they looked at, they gave people accelerometers, so, you know, all these, these step uh, measuring um, devices uh, that we can all buy, and they put them into an MRI scanner, and then looked at how does the, the minutes per day that they spend with light activity, so light activity being just walking, for example, how does that correlate with brain volume? And it turns out for every hour of light activity per day, the brain was, of those participants, was about a good year younger, meaning the brain was larger. And if you look at that, this was true in all age groups. This was true for the 40 to 50 year olds. It was particularly true for those 50 to 60. So there was the biggest difference really was in those 50 to 60 um, between those who had very little activity to those who did much more. But it was also true in 60 to 70 and 70 to 80. So it's never too late to start. That's the one message. The other message is between 50 and 60, it really makes a big difference. And the third message is you really want to make physical activity part of our everyday life. So just to summarize this whole, you know, enormous field of exercise and the brain studies, um, what it shows right now is that exercise can actually uh, foster making new brain cells and better connectivity between cells, better blood supply, better mood and well-being, healthier weight, less diabetes, healthier heart, which in turn then has a very positive effect on the brain as well. Better sleep, which we already heard is really crucial for brain health, and reduced inflammation, which is going to be very likely a key player in brain health. Now, what about nutrition? Well, nutrition has been studied as well, although it is sometimes a bit difficult because we are not very good in remembering what we're eating and you'd have to do this over a very long time. Nonetheless, there is now mounting evidence that really supports that nutrition can actually prevent cognitive decline. The diet that is most studied is really the Mediterranean diet and it has the best evidence for benefits on cognition. There is a whole host of different beneficial nutrients, some of them and some of those factors I've listed here, but it really seems to be the package rather than specific individual nutrients that make the difference. And so one of the diets that uh, was built on and did, is kind of the improved Mediterranean diet is the so-called MIND diet. And what this entails is to eat more green, leafy and other vegetables, nuts, berries, blueberries, for example, beans, whole grains, and, and then fish and poultry about once a week, and you use olive oil as the main fat, and then wine in moderation was about a glass a day. At the same time, you could get negative points. 
for eating red meat, butter, cheese, pastry, sweets, fried or fast food. So you had to really, the, the, the key here is to limit those foods, not to completely eliminate them, but to limit them. This was a study done as part of the Rush Memory and Aging Project. There were what, 960 participants, so nearly 1,000. And what they found was that uh, when following people up for several years, the incidence, so the onset of, of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's was halved. Now, that is for those people who adhere to the diet more closely. And for those who, whoops, who developed cognitive decline, um, the, the, the age of onset was delayed by seven and a half years. Now, we're actually doing studies into the MIND diet here as well. And what we found, we're looking at a group of Parkinson's patients. We found that the age of onset was actually also delayed. Uh, for the whole group, if you look at men and women together, this is what you see in this graph here. So instead of your mid-50s, um, for those who had a poor diet, the people who adhere to the diet more closely, this was now pushed to you know, the early 60s. And interestingly enough, there was a difference in men and women. So first of all, women actually generally had better diets. They adhered closer to the diet. And in addition, what we found was that the age of onset in men of Parkinson's disease for, for those who adhered most closely to the diet was about six years higher than those who did not adhere to the diet. And in women, this was a decade later. So just imagine what that means for an individual. That would be a decade of not having Parkinson's. That is huge in terms of the individual, but also on a societal level. Now, what about community and relationships? Just very briefly, it turns out uh, through numerous studies, including the Harvard study of adult development, which has been going on for many, many decades, that social integration and community are crucial for happiness and longevity. Loneliness literally kills, and it is as powerful as smoking or alcoholism in its effect. So when we created the Brain Wellness Program, our goals were, of course, the creation of community, we wanted to focus on patient-centered clinical care. In addition to treatment, we really wanted prevention to be part of the program because what I can prevent, as we just saw with a diet, is so much better than trying to run after the disease and trying to treat it afterwards. Research had to be an integral part of the program, as well as education, both of the public as well as of students in all related fields. There had to be community engagement and it had to be interdisciplinary with a lot of collaborations. So fast forward to October 5th, 2019, and after incredibly generous um, donations uh, and made possible really by our donors, we launched the Brain Wellness Program. So this is not even a year yet, but it's been a, a whirlwind what has been happening since. And we've got a very dedicated group of uh, volunteers and super dedicated team. And we're currently offering a whole range of programs, all free at present because they are supported by our donors. And we really want to make this accessible to people who want to participate in these um, classes. We have exercise classes, Sally will speak to that. We've got yoga classes, we've got gardening and nutrition. We've got mindfulness, we've got how to live your best with a chronic brain condition, we've got an open talk cafe to socialize, we've got wellness outreach for those without computers, we've got music and movement, we've got artful living for the um, visual the arts, we've got improv theater for brain health, which has been really also particularly successful, we've got a book club, and then we've got the Wellness Wednesdays on the first Wednesday each month which is centered as an educational and, and active program around certain topics. Now, how did this all change in the time of COVID-19? So physical isolation that is now obviously necessary, then often unfortunately leads to social isolation as well. It leads to heightened anxieties. Community centers and gyms were either closed or now have been reopening partially, but of course, Many of our um, participants are older and it's probably not the best idea to be um, going out and, and being in big groups. 
So what we did within literally a week or two was to convert the entire program into an online program. And from mid-March to when the spring program began in early April, we had everything online and we had even grown the number of courses. So I'm, I'm really proud of our team because this is so much a team affair uh, to make this possible. Now, the silver lining in all of that was that instead of running the program in person um, at UBC and uh, being really mostly accessible to people who live close by, uh, we now, much faster than we had anticipated, really uh, met or have been meeting our goal to serve the entire province. It's the BC Brain Wellness Program after all, and our clinics serve the entire province. We are provincial clinics. And so far we have uh, participant focus groups. We've had excellent feedback on how this has been working. Now, word about research. So obviously there are many, many research um, opportunities here. Yeah. From the treatment of physical, emotional, cognitive symptoms to which particular combination or type of exercise or nutrition is optimal to reach a specific goal. So, for example, to improve cognition, to prevent falls, to improve mood, etc. And that, of course, is then also related to how do I personalize those interventions? And somebody, you know, who an older woman will have different needs than a middle-aged guy, for example. So, sex, age, medical status, uh, current activities, personal preferences, the setting that you're living in, all of those things will play a role. Obviously, what are the best strategies to slow disease progression down and can we slow disease progression down? Now, what are strategies to prevent chronic brain disorders and hopefully how can we combine those interventions to really get the best effect? My big vision would really be to run a prospective forward study and to do the starting uh, early in life to um, at least in middle age, um, because this is, as we saw, really where we need to start doing these things. What are the mechanisms? I mean, we're at UBC and the, the um, Center for Brain Health, and we have a um, state-of-the-art uh, neuroscience center, um, and we're collaborating with many researchers. So we can do brain imaging. Um, we do a lot of microbiome work. That's my mother uh, uh, research area. Um, role of inflammation, blood biomarkers, genetics, etc. And then, of course, what are the best care delivery models, and how do health economics uh, support that, so that we can eventually go to the Ministry of Health and say, look, this is actually really worth your while. So in summary, uh, we are envisaging and implementing really a new model to approach brain health. These brain wellness activities are complementary to the traditional medical model. They are not replacing it, but they are complementary to really optimize care. They're interdisciplinary, they're collaborative and silo busting. They are active and empowering engagement of participants in their own health care. We are engaging users at all levels of planning as well as of execution. We are looking at both treatment, but also prevention, which I think is just so incredibly important. We're looking not just at one brain disorder, but at a growing and wide range. So we can't cover everything yet, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, we're collaborating with community organizations. We're doing research as an absolutely integral part of the activities. And we're following principles of the learning healthcare system with ongoing improvements of our programs. So we're really seeking feedback. The research insights are then shared with the community. We are also educating the next generation of clinicians and researchers in a wide area of fields. And most importantly, what this really drives home is that lifestyle choices, exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, sleep, et cetera, are really the most powerful tools we have right now to reduce our risk for brain disorders of aging. So with that, I very much thank our donors without whom none of this would be possible. I thank everybody at uh, the Hospital Foundation. I thank UBC, Vancouver Coastal Health, um, the School of Music, um, all of whom have been extremely supportive. Um, you can go to our website. That is where you can sign up for courses, events, the mailing list. We will celebrate World Brain Day on July 22nd, so next Wednesday, and we'll also then launch the Summer 2020 Brain Wellness Challenge, and John will talk more about that. And that's it. Over to you, um, John. Thank you so much, Dr. Cresswell. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Sally Stelling. 
Uh, Sally has been a registered physiotherapist for 20 years and has worked in a variety of public and private healthcare settings. Uh, she leads the exercise programs and, and uh, for the BC Brain Wellness Program, and she does one-on-one uh, -on -one assessments with, uh, with people who come through the program to better understand their needs and goals. And so we're pleased to have Sally here to tell us a bit more about the benefits of exercise and to give us an example of what it's like to be a participant in the BC Brain Wellness Program. Sally, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Dr. Cresswell, and thank you for um, for allowing me to join and participate. So, I'll, very briefly, I've got just a few minutes, so I'll try and stick to my time. Um, we started in early uh, December, classes started in person on campus. Fast forward, COVID hit, and we had to move everything online. We have now had an average of about 100 people per week attending, not individual people, but 100 attendances of exercise classes within a week. Our exercise program is um, what I would term multimodal in that we address cardiovascular exercise, strength training. There's a large focus on balance and um, some cognitive dual tasking aspects in some of the classes. We now have uh, three different instructors teaching, a, a seated class, body conditioning class, a higher lower intensity interval class. I teach the majority of the exercise classes, but the team is growing as the need is growing. Um, we've also expanded the yoga program now to three different levels to, to really fit with whatever a person's ability is. And I would say that's the key message of the Brain Wellness Exercise Program is we focus on ability. Everybody has abilities and we focus on goals and those abilities and try and match those two things together. Um, just briefly, when, when everything had to change so rapidly, we gathered some feedback from participants. Um, many of them found that the Brain Wellness programs, not just the exercise programs, but the programs in general were a lifeline. They were an opportunity to have social connection when they felt really isolated and alone. Um, they encouraged people to get into a routine. So people were finding they, they'd lost the motivation to, to exercise on their own, but having a group environment to exercise provided a routine and an opportunity to, um, oh, the lights just went off. I'm having technical difficulties. Sorry, folks. Anyway, um, offered that routine and that opportunity to be consistent with their program. Um, a lot of people also mentioned that they were sitting more, so they felt they were sitting at a desk. They weren't doing their regular um, outdoor exercise and activity because of COVID. So we had the opportunity to really work on exercises that got people out of a hunched over seated posture, get them moving on a regular basis. And people mentioned also we did some tests and there was a definite improvement in gait speed, balance and uh, muscle strength. So that was not a research study that was uh, just, just observational through a very small cohort of people. But I'm very excited to look at the data that we will get in the years to come and see how exercise really benefits people, not just on a physical, but a social and emotional level as well. So, uh, so now we're just gonna we're gonna flip things over to questions. So, thank you so much, Dr. Gresswell and, and Sally, for your presentations. Uh, so, we're gonna jump into the Q and A. Uh, as a reminder, please, you can drop uh, questions into the chat box, um, and uh, we'll try to keep them as broad as possible uh, and avoid specific medical diagnoses and conditions. Um, and so, my first question for you, you know, here maybe we shouldn't assume anything. Um, why is the shrinking brain bad? Why is it bad if the brain shrinks? Well, essentially, you know, the more connections you have, the more brain cells you have, uh, the more you can do. And it's a sign of that your brain is going to be less efficient, that it work, has to work harder with the remaining um, structures to get things done, which also means you're, um, you know, you're probably having more of a limit as to what you can do. So, for example, how many things you can do at the same time, this multitasking that Sally just did with us. Uh, um, but the good thing is you, you can also train that and with every um, training you do, with every practice you do, you make new brain connections, which is really, really important. 
uh, um, and you can even grow certain parts of your brain uh, that are involved in, in those activities. That might change, you know, that this is probably different once you have a chronic brain condition, such as, for example, Alzheimer's. Um, but um, for the, the normally functioning brain, but the aging brain, as we saw in, in the slides that I showed, this is certainly possible. So we are changing and shaping our brain all the time. Thanks. Um, so are, what activities um, at the BC Brain Wellness Program are open to people who have a, have a health, quote unquote, healthy brain? Or who, who is it open to? So broadly speaking, the goal, of course, is that the program is open to everybody who is interested in brain health. Now, realistically, from just an organizational point of view, some of the classes um, can take more participants than others. So if I, for example, have a, um, there's a group of um, people that do the how to live with a chronic brain condition, there's going to be a, because it's a group discussion, there is going to be a limit on how many people can participate at the same time. Having said that, um, if we have a lot of people who are interested and are on the wait list, then that tells us, well, then we need to offer this, need to offer another class. So we are very dynamic. We're really trying to serve the, the need and the requests. Um, I let Sally speak to the exercise. Uh, there are, of course, you know, music many, many, many people can do together. Um, but I, I hand it over to Sally for the exercise. Thank you, Sophie. Um, for the exercise, there's some classes same, same exactly as what Sophie said. Some are limited in capacity because there's a need for more individualized attention. Um, it also depends on the different instructors. I have um, kinesiology and physiotherapy student volunteers that work with me. So I have additional people to help and just keep an eye on participants. So my capacity is to have some larger groups, um, but we are revisiting it all the time. And just week by week, we need to add programs or shuffle things a little bit to meet the needs of the population. But in, within my classes, I have a mixture of healthy aging participants, participants with um, Parkinson's, dystonia, MS, stroke, um, Alzheimer's, dementia, care partners. So it's a real, it's a, it's a real collaboration of everybody, um, and we just give options and variations so that everyone can feel like they can benefit. But it's constant. We rely a lot on feedback, so people are letting us know what's what's working and and where we can improve, and trying very hard to meet the needs. So I don't know that that exactly answers your question, but. Um, Pretty much everyone's welcome to, to join, and we um, would love to create this proactive program that really, in years to come, you can see by participating in this, in this we have delayed change or prevented change. Okay, and the best place to kind of start to get information would be the website, uh, www.bcbrainwellness.ca. Right. Yeah. Right. You'll find all uh, the programs there, the events, everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Um, can you, are you doing any collaborations with other brain institutes or, or, or centers or hospitals across Canada or, or around the world with respect yeah, so, to this initiative? Yeah, so I mean, we're still a very young program, but we have been um, speaking to a lot of uh, different centers around Canada, and that is obviously one of the things we're going to do going forward. So, um, the clinicians and researchers uh, are very well connected. I've spoken to Calgary, I've spoken to Ottawa. Uh, um, there, are, there are some interest in Toronto. So we, we are very much branching out um, with the beginning of that process. But the beauty, of course, is now that it's online, uh, um, we can share this. You know, this people can participate. Uh, I think Sally said there's somebody from the Kosovo who was participating. and. Uh, um, that is all possible now, and that is very much the goal, you know, to, to have a collaborative network, not to reinvent the wheel. It's not about competition, but we're all in this together. We have very much a, a common and shared goal, uh, um, and this is the spirit of the program, for sure. Great, thanks. You, uh, you spoke a lot about uh, sort of good nutrition and, and eating all the food you know, and, and good reminder to, to eat your greens and, and so forth. Uh, can you speak to a little bit to the benefits of nutritional supplements and, and whether you'd recommend them in terms of improving brain health? 
Yes, excellent question. And of course, one that comes up all the time in the clinic. Now, I'm not a nutritionist, I always have to say that, but uh, I am a physician and we do discuss this all the time. Uh, um, it depends very much on the individual situation. So if somebody comes in and they have an actual deficiency, let's say in vitamin B12, which is one of the vitamins that you really need for brain health, then supplementing that specifically is of course the right thing to do because you have a need. Now, for the general population, if I was to use any supplements, I think vitamin D, because we're so far north and uh, our ability to get it from the sun being so far north is, is less than uh, people living further south. So that would be one that uh, one could uh, consider. Uh, um, for my Parkinson's patients, B vitamins, vitamin D uh, are probably some to consider. Generally speaking though, I think that a, and that's what the studies show, a much larger effect or on people who follow a whole diet. So rather than, if you think about it, you know, the, what are we made of? Where is the structure and the material coming from? Well, it's coming from our diets. So what you eat will determine who you are. I mean, this, this old saying is actually true. So if you take a little pill and supplement one thing, this is never gonna have the same effect as actually having your whole intake optimized. And it probably is, the sum of many, many, many things, but it might be even more than the sum of these many things. You know, taking in fiber, which is then converted to, um, by the uh, gut microbiome into uh, um, other substances such as short chain fatty acids that are then helping to um, keep inflammation at bay. There are these polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. There are the vitamins. So there are the flavonoids, all these antioxidants. So these diets, like the Mediterranean or the MIND diet, combine all of those things. So unless there is a clinically proven relevant deficiency in a specific nutrient, um, I would suggest to eat a very healthy diet rather than uh, relying on supplements and then thinking, oh, I can get away with anything in the diet. I'm passionate about that, as you can see, but uh, the data made me even more passionate because I was just, you know, yeah, it was quite mind-blowing, actually. Yes, I really wish there was a pill that would just sort of negate the effects of eating that bag of chips. <laughs> well, and it's not about, you know, you can do that. You don't have to only ever eat healthy. It's about your batting average. Um, and, you know, limiting, you can eat some of those treats, but just limit their size. And, you know, there's really, there's lovely food out there. In there and I, I think that if you learn how to prepare it, you'll really enjoy it. So one of the things I love to do, uh, and that comes back to our summer brain wellness challenge, is to get all these fantastic recipes that people have with all these ingredients and make a cookbook out of it. You know, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Our brain wellness cookbook. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, on your one of your slides, you talked about a connection between hearing and and brain uh, wellness. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting one. So poor hearing, often in middle age already, and future dementia risk are actually linked. It is not entirely clear yet whether this is actually causative or whether there is the same factor that makes both of them happen. Uh, um, there's ongoing research. We've actually done research on hearing in Parkinson's, which is currently just before it's going to be submitted for publication. And what we found in Parkinson's was it wasn't so much the actual perception of a tone, that was just as it was for age-matched controls, but it was the ability to make sense of what people heard. So being able to understand a sentence, particularly in noise, and there's some evidence, there's a study in, in no, people who are otherwise healthy but older with hearing problems that a choir intervention can actually help with that because it would train that all the time, right? You have to, to really differentiate what you're hearing. And so one of the studies I really wanted to do, since we already have the hearing study and we know this is a problem and it's a very practical problem for, for communication, you know, not being able to hear a noise and not being able to decipher what the other person is saying, is to do a music intervention with singing and see whether that could improve that, that ability to make sense of what we're hearing and for people with Parkinson's. So it's a very interesting and also potentially um, addressable risk factor. 
We're yeah, working with all geology at UBC for that. Sounds good. So I imagine that a lot of people who are on this webinar are, are people who are really interested in brain uh, health and brain wellness, and and you know they're they're doing their best to to eat healthy and and to to stay active. Um, and maybe they have a hard time, uh, you know, convincing partners or, or aging parents or other loved ones. Um, do you have any sort of suggestions or strategies on how we can uh, perhaps encourage those in our life uh, to to take to take up these interventions in the in their life? Yeah, I think so. There are many strategies, and I'm sure Sally will have comments on that as well. So one of them is, of course, the purely cognitive. You know, it's good for you, but that doesn't get people off the couch necessarily. I think that's an important thing that you know it's good for you. And for me, as a very data-driven person, I see that, and you know, I saw a data science, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, how can you not? So you have to just do this. Now, um, but what is a really strong motivator is once you you get your emotional and your social brain involved. So if you do this with somebody else, if you enjoy what you're doing, if you have goals that are concrete and achievable, so you don't try to change your entire life overnight, but you set a very concrete goal, you work on that, you have a success, and then you build on that. And then you have a group of people, which is why our classes are all group-based, whom you are accountable to and these people look out for you and they encourage you and they will pull up with you if you are not showing up um, and then really doing it together so harnessing the emotional side the community side I think is key and that also speaks to you know if you want to to do this you have to live it to lead it so all of us who are on the team can't just not do this. You, you you are infected by it. You have to also follow those same principles. And one of our um, nurses who who speaks about this very openly, um, when we she of course as a health professional knew exactly that what is healthy and what you should do, but she struggled with her weight. And then you know, when our um, research group started as a group to just doing all these studies and then implementing exercise themselves. So they were going out and doing exercise and eating healthily. And she lost a hundred pounds because now suddenly there was this group dynamic. There was an emotional and social buy-in. There were successes and that kept it going. And mm -hmm. so the cognition is the first part, but then you have to add uh, good uh, motivation. Sally, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot here, but I'm just so passionate no. about it. <laughs> No, I think, you know, the, the old saying, you can, you know, you can't make somebody do something that they don't buy into themselves. Like there's that element. And I had a couple of, I think we're up to about four couples now where the wife had joined. Somehow it seems to be the woman that are a little bit more uh, ready to jump in. Um, and the husbands have been kind of watching from the sofa and then they email me, can I, can I join too? And they're like, I, I, I see what you're doing and it, it looks like fun. And, so sometimes they just need to watch and observe a little bit first before jumping in. And any of the brain wellness programs are there to try. It's not that you sign up and you're, you know, committed for life. You, you try it and then you form that sense of community, exactly like you said, and that accountability. Um, it, it's, as a physio, I often ask people, you know, will you even do the exercises that I give you? Um, be honest. Most people don't. It's just, <laughs> we can just save time. <laughs> But um, in a group, it changes things considerably. And that's a lot of what the feedback we've got is as soon as people are doing things in a group, they do them and they push themselves a little bit harder than they would in the group. Great, thank you. So we're, we have time for just one last question. Um, if uh, either or both of you just speak briefly to the link between uh, mindfulness and brain wellness and brain disease, and uh, if you could just speak to that briefly. Yeah, so there's increasing um, evidence uh, that this is beneficial for our brains. It can certainly lead to stress reduction. Stress, uh, and I'm talking about negative constant stress, um, has a whole host of negative um, impacts from inflammation to sleep to um, diabetes and blood pressure, etc. Um, and so mindfulness can certainly address that. It can help with anxiety and mood. It can uh, make you eat more mindfully. You can be mindful about the choices you make in the day. Um, personally, I 
just also really enjoy it. But um, there's there's certainly mounting evidence that this is uh, healthy, brain healthy, both in the immediate symptom um, control as well as in the long run. Obviously, more research needs to be done. Um, there are plenty of studies uh, in, that uh, should be done, and uh, hopefully we'll do some of them. Great, thank you. Um, so thank, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, I do, before we uh, let everyone go, I do have to go have a healthy lunch, of course. Uh, I do want to express my gratitude to, to Dr. Cresswell and Sally for taking the time to speak to us today and, and answer all of our questions. We know brain health is so important. Uh, one in three Canadians will be affected by brain disease, disorder, or injury in their lifetime. Um, and if you have a brain, uh, serious brain disease or injury in BC, you will likely uh, uh, come to one of the facilities that our foundation supports, uh, VGH, UBC Hospital, GF Strong Rehab, Javed Moafagian Center for Brain Health. Um, and so I just want to highlight two uh, exciting upcoming opportunities for those of you who want to continue the conversation around brain wellness. And the first one is actually next Wednesday, July 22nd, is World Brain Day. Uh, and the BC Brain Wellness Program will be celebrating with a virtual webcast. The webcast is open to everyone. It includes a special Ask the Expert uh, panel where you can ask neurologists questions. You'll be able to participate in some other fun interactive activities. Hopefully you enjoyed that exercise activity. I think there's gonna be one around mindfulness and dance. Um, there will also be a keynote address uh, addressed by uh, Tim Haig Sr. Uh, he's a motivational speaker. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 46. Um, but uh, he went on, him and his son went on together as a team to win the Amazing Race Canada version in season one. So you'll hear more uh, from him next Wednesday. Um, also at World Brain Day, we'll, we will be launching our Summer Brain Wellness Challenge. Uh, people who sign up will be challenged to participate and track their brain wellness activities over a six-week period uh, while raising funds for the Brain Wellness Program. And I know a lot of us have been stuck at home and, and probably spending a lot of that time sitting, uh, so this is a great opportunity to get active uh, and to make this summer count. And so uh, just to give you a, a sense of, you know, you know, you know why the BC Brain Wellness Program is so great. We're here. We have a short video uh, featuring Roberta Beiser, who uh, participates in the Brain Wellness Program. The day I heard you have Parkinson's, and for now there's no cure, my life changed. After absorbing that statement, I decided that I would repurpose my life to do what I could to change things. I have heard that exercise is one of the most important things to do when you have Parkinson's disease. So I am delighted to hear that Dr. Sylvia Griswold had developed a program specifically for Parkinson's that involves brain wellness. I participated in a number of these, from doing exercises online, as we have to now, to singing, to doing uh, the art program, to doing French conversation, and I'm very keen on trying to do as much as I can to help myself. And along with this, I want to help other people who have Parkinson's now or may have it in the future. So I am very keen to support research. And Dr. Silva's program is an excellent example of that. Based on exercises and brain wellness, that's the focus that we are attending them. And uh, Dr. Silkwell herself is such a dynamic person, so personable, so accomplished, and so committed to helping that it's hard not to follow her path. I am delighted to say that I am going to contribute a number of dollars to the wellness program to increase the research possibilities and see how it can help the situation of people with Parkinson's. I am very committed to this, and I invite you to join me. The campaign will be matched dollar for dollar, up to $25,000. It's reachable, it's attainable, and join me in doing it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Roberta, for that inspiring message. And uh, hopefully, if, if you're still not sure about getting involved with the BC Brain Wellness Program, uh, you know, you've heard uh, directly from a participant about the benefits of it. So I encourage you to check it out. And uh, 
and really excited that uh, all donations received between now and the end of the summer challenge will be matched up to $25,000. Uh, and these funds will help ensure that we're able to continue to make the BC Brain Wellness Program available free of charge uh, to anyone who wishes to participate. So I hope you will consider joining us at World Brain Day next Wednesday. Um, and after this webcast, you'll receive, an, uh, you'll receive an email with more information on both of these initiatives. Uh, the email will also include a link to a short survey, so please take a moment to provide us with your feedback. To all of our Foundation supporters and friends participating today, thank you for taking time to hear and learn more about brain wellness. Please feel free to reach out to any of us here at the Foundation with any other questions you may have. I do apologize that we didn't get to all the questions today. Uh, I hope that you and your families uh, stay well and keep safe. Thank you all and goodbye.